Boy, uh, so grateful that we can be back together again, regathering. Isn't it great to be able to be here and to gather together again? It's so good, so good to see you guys. And uh, man, just a beautiful, beautiful day. Let, let me ask you guys a question. Um, does this sound create any issues for anybody? That... Um, well, I'm, I'm glad because for years, when I heard that sound, it would create in me a great deal of anxiety. Matter of fact, when I heard that sound, someone pulling their keys out of their pocket, I, I wouldn't be able to breathe. I would break out in a cold sweat. Anxiety would rise up inside of me. And I had to actually look and see what the sound was. And until I saw that it was a person with keys, I would have this anxiety. And let me give you a little context of where that came from. So when I was uh, five years old, I was at a friend's house and, uh, and we were playing around in the backyard and I had never actually had a physical encounter with a dog, never pet a dog, didn't know anybody had a dog at that point. My friend had an English bulldog, real stout little dog. And, and looking back, I don't think anything malicious was intended by the dog, but I was running, we were playing in the backyard, I was running one way and the dog ran right at me and he jumped and he hit me so hard that I slammed my head on the concrete behind me, I was crying, his mom came out, my stomach hurt so bad, I lifted up my shirt and I had blood blisters where the dog's claws had hit me when it had knocked me over. I went home crying, I never went back to my friend's house ever again. A few years later, I was in uh, about second grade um, and I was uh, at a friend's birthday party. And we're running around, there's a bunch of kids, we're all in the backyard, we're all playing, and my friends had a terrier. And the terrier, for whatever reason, when I was running, came up behind me and bit me on the backside, hurt like the dickens. I mean, I screamed, it was really painful. I ran home from there, and, and my mom checked, and, and I had, I still remember the blue lines the two bruises of where the, the, the fangs of the dog went underneath my skin and then came out again. And I had two blue lines and a really bad bruise from that. And I never went back to my friend's house ever again. Fast forward another year and, and my friend Brian Schneider, who was my best friend uh, when I was that age, uh, we would walk to school together, his house was on the way, and he said, hey, stop by my house and pick me up, and, and we'll walk together as we walk to Washington Irving Elementary School in Milwaukee, and, and so I went to Brian's house, and I reached to ring the doorbell, and right as I was reaching the doorbell, I could hear Brian laughing, and he came running from the side of the house laughing, and behind him was his dog. And uh, the dog took one look at me, and their dog was actually a German Shepherd guard dog with a spike collar. And as I was reaching for the doorbell, he took my whole shoulder into his mouth and bit down. I screamed, I ran home, it was two blocks away. I had puncture wounds in my armpit. Brian's mom came over, I was freaking out, she was freaking out, it was a really bad day. And then we moved out to the country and now I'm in uh, sixth grade and I'm walking home. And um, I'm, as I'm walking from my friend's house to my house, the neighbors across the street, they had a dog and the dog came running out to the road when he saw me and he immediately got down in a hunch position, bared his teeth, the hair on the back stood up and he growled and he looked like a wolf. Now the dog, was a hunting dog and the owner was an alcoholic and he used to beat the dog to make it mean and he named the dog Whiskey. I did the only thing that I could think of at the time. I said, Whiskey, go home. And when I said that, Whiskey immediately grabbed onto my thigh. Now, I knew I needed to run home at that point. I was actually in front of the house. The problem was we lived on about an acre and a half of property so the house was set back a little ways. I scream and I bolt down the driveway and whiskey is hot on my heels. And I'm sitting there thinking as I'm running, if I get to the front door and I've gotta pull out my keys, as soon as I get to the front door, he's got me. 
The only chance that I had was to run around the back of the house because we had a patio door there in front of the family room and we always had people that were in the family room and my only hope was to run around so that people could see me, see what's happening and rescue me. I just get around the corner of the house and I hear a high pitched whistle. Whiskey who is ready to pounce on me turns around and he goes back home. And the one thing that all of those attacks had in common was the sound of a dog tag on a chain. And so for years, whenever I'd hear this sound, I couldn't breathe, I would start to sweat, I would start to feel anxious, and I would have to see that it's actually somebody's car keys. That developed a phobia inside of me. We all have fears that we deal with in life. And a problem with fear is this, is that fear sets the limits on your life. It determines the limits of your life. And so whenever I had friends who would say, hey, do you wanna come over? Hey, we're having a party. Do you wanna hang out? What do you think was the first question that I asked? Do you have a dog? And if they had a dog, I'd say, I can't. I'd make up some kind of an excuse. I had this, this, this limitation on my life because of the fear that lived inside of me that was based on things that actually happened to me. And the problem with fear is that it puts limits on our lives if we let it. Now the fact is, is, is there's all kinds of fears, there's all kinds of phobias. I also had aquaphobia. By the way, fear of dogs is called cyanophobia. The fear of water is aquaphobia. I also had a fear of water because of a near drowning that I had when I was in third grade. So whenever there was a pool party, guess who wasn't in the pool? Me. There's all kinds of fears. They have, you know, the fear for being outdoors is agoraphobia. Some people don't, can't go outside, so what happens is, is they stay inside and their fear puts a limit on their life. We all deal with them. Some are phobias and some are fears. Sometimes Christmas is terrifying for people because you have claustrophobia. Anybody have claustrophobia? That was a bad dad joke. They didn't laugh at the other two services either, so it's okay. <laughs> But here's what we can say about fear. Is that, is that like when we grow up as children, we discover all kinds of fears. Many of us dealt with fear of the dark. Did anybody have the fear of the dark? Okay, anybody watching that had fear of the dark say, yep, I did, I did. Here's what you learn about fear, is that fear doesn't tell you what's true, it only tells you what you believe. Because the fact is, is there's nothing to worry about in the dark. You flip on the lights, it's exactly the same. But fear teaches us that there is something bad that's gonna happen. It sets up a negative expectation for us of, of, of the fact that I'm gonna experience pain, I'm gonna experience loss, or that I'm gonna experience failure. Fear is a negative expectation that fills in the blanks for us. And there are fears that are good fears though. Not all fear is bad, right? Like the fear of don't run into the street without looking both ways because something bad can happen to you. That's a good fear. Some fears teach us a sense of respect and keeps us protected. Some fears are really important. And we've been saying in this series that emotions are not your enemy. Fear isn't necessarily your enemy, but if you let it control your life, it absolutely can set the boundaries on your life. And you were created for more than that. And God wants you to be able to walk in freedom. He wants you to walk free from the control of fear over your life. And so today we're gonna to talk about how do you move beyond your fears? You gotta move beyond them. By the way, have you noticed you've gotta move? Have you noticed that, that when you say, God, take away my fear, that it doesn't go away? There's a reason for that. Because God is never just gonna take fear away from you. What he's gonna do is he's gonna invite you to step into a space where you trust him and where fear no longer has power over you. That's what he's gonna do. Today I'm gonna to give you three options, three options, all you have to do is choose one. When you deal with fear in your life, all you have to do is choose one of these things and you will experience a breakthrough. These are things that I've learned from dealing with the fears in my life. These are things that are in scriptures and I want you to be able to break free from the things that hold you back. So let's talk about how to move beyond your fears. Number one option is this, is you've got to choose the greater fear. Oftentimes people allow fear to hold them back because they fear the wrong thing. You see something, 
You look at the pain, you look at the loss, or you look at the sense of, of impending failure, and you won't step into it because you are afraid. Instead, you should choose a greater fear. You wanna know how I got over my fear of dogs? I got over my fear of dogs because I met a young lady that I was falling in love with named Maria. And here's the deal. Maria did not have a dog. She had two dogs. And she had the biggest dog I've ever seen in my life. She had a St. Bernard. And Gretel was huge. And, and if I was going to pursue a relationship of love with this beautiful young lady named Maria, I had to have a greater fear. The greater fear was, if I allow my fear of dogs to keep me and hold me back and limit my life, I'm gonna miss out on something even better. And I can remember the first day that I set foot in, at Maria's house and her family and, and the first day when I stepped into her kitchen and you know they had a long table in the kitchen and you know long and, and narrow and had a bench seat on this side of it. And I walk in and I see Gretel. Now my anxiety was already up because I knew she had dogs. And Gretel, when she saw me, went to hide under the table. She was so big that her head stuck out one end and her rear end stuck out the other end. And Gretel hung her head down and wouldn't make eye contact with me, thinking that if she can't make eye contact with me that she's invisible or something like that. Like little kids, she wouldn't look at me. She was just like this. Didn't want, like, you don't see me, I'm not here, you don't see me. Her other dog was named Mystery because he wandered into their yard one day and never left. He was a golden retriever, Irish setter mix. He was a sweetheart. And both of those dogs, two big dogs that I had been afraid of before I went there, but I didn't allow that fear to keep me. There was a greater fear that I had to respond to. The greater fear was, do I really wanna live the rest of my life letting dogs limit who my friends are and where I'm gonna be able to be, or do I wanna pursue these relationships? Jesus talked about this because for a lot of people that were considering following Jesus, they knew that what was involved was, was that that meant that I might get persecuted. That meant that I might lose my business, that meant that I might lose my social connections. That means I won't be a part of the Jewish community anymore, that they won't allow me to participate with them. And people were really concerned because they'd already seen what the religious leaders were doing to people that were choosing Jesus. And Jesus, in addressing this, said this in Matthew chapter 10. He said, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Boy, that's, pretty, that's a pretty heavy hammer, isn't it? I mean, if that was Jesus' only message and he was just scaring people into, into following him, like, you don't wanna go to hell. Gotta throw both your body and soul into hell. That would be a horrible message, but he didn't stop there. He was demonstrating the power of God, but take a look at what he said next. He then went on to say, What's the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? Like, what's the, what's the price of a chicken sandwich? $3.50? Yes, he agrees. And then he says, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. Well, I thought you were just trying to scare us. No, 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 no. I was just telling you how powerful your father is. Don't be afraid, you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Nobody loves you the way your heavenly father does. Nobody cares about you the way your heavenly father does. Nobody is so intimately involved with the details of your life and your being than your heavenly father is. He is all powerful and he cares for you. The greater fear is don't worry about what people can do to you or what they will say to you or what they will think about you. Well, if I become a Christian, am I gonna become one of those online social media people that drive me crazy and they're always talking about what they hate and who they're against and condemning this and that and the other thing and, 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 and people get worried about that. I know that when I had the opportunity to surrender my life to Jesus, I can remember having an argument inside of my head going, are you gonna make me you know, some kind of a Jesus freak? Are you gonna send me to Africa, send me somewhere I don't wanna go? What are you gonna do with my life, God? Have you ever had that fear? 
both things actually came true in my life. And, he, and, and here's the deal. What, what God put on my heart was this. If you could trust me with your soul for eternity, what makes you, can't, what makes you think you can't trust me with your life in time? And, and, and there's, a, there's a moment where, where God is saying, forget about what people think of you. Don't worry about the expectations. What are my friends gonna say, man? If you like give your life to Jesus, don't worry about them. They're not gonna be around long. But think about what lasts forever. You know, it's, it's, it's like the, the, the Chronicles of Narnia. Any of you guys read or watch the movie Narnia, right? Like I didn't read the book, but I saw the movie and, and there's that scene towards the end of the movie where Mr. Beaver, who's been on all these adventures, is gonna introduce Susan to Aslan. Aslan, who really was like a, a character that was a picture of Jesus in that movie. Mr. Beaver says this, um, by the way, Susan, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought, I thought he was a man. Is he, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And then here's what Jesus would say. Is it safe to follow Jesus? Absolutely not. But he is the king and he is good. And he will lead you into the life that you were created to live. The greater fear when you are afraid to take a step forward is missing out on the life that God created you for. That is not something you ever want to live with. There is a greater fear. You've got to take the fear that's in front of you and you've got to choose the greater fear. You can't worry about what anybody else thinks. You can't worry about what anybody else expects. You've got to choose the greater fear. What if you miss out on why God created you in the first place? For some of you, it's like, that will mean, hey, there's that girl that you wanted to ask out for a date, guys, and you're afraid of the pain of rejection, losing out, maybe she's just not gonna pay attention to you, maybe you're gonna experience failure, maybe she just rejects you, and so you don't ask. You know what the greater fear is? That you spend the rest of your life as someone who lets fear control their lives and put the limits on you? Oh, that's a greater fear. You don't want that fear. No, 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 no. Ask. If she says no, it's okay. At least you're not the person that you used to be anymore. When you're struggling with addiction and you're you're like, I got this thing inside of me and I just can't seem to break it. And and the fear is is if if I I let people know what I'm dealing with and what's going on inside of me, then people are gonna reject me. Then people are gonna look down at me. They're gonna go, wow, how disgusting are you? They're gonna look down on me and say, yo, you don't measure up and there's a, there's a fear that I'm gonna be hurt, the fear that I'm gonna lose friends, fear that, that people are gonna look down on me and that I'm gonna be ashamed. Listen, no, 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 no. There's a, there's a place where God wants you to step into. The greater fear is do you really wanna spend the rest of your life with a prison inside of you like that? And see, the way that people break free is they go, I gotta choose the greater fear. As, as hard as this is, as difficult as it is, it sure is so much better than living in a secret. There's a freedom of people knowing me and knowing my struggles and loving me and accepting me and helping me to be better. That's so much more life-giving. So I gotta choose the greater fear. You've got to choose the greater fear. Fear, here's the second option, other than choosing the greater fear, is you've gotta choose the greater story. That's another thing you do, choose the greater story. Here's why I say that. Fear is telling you a story all the time. And the story is, here's the pain that's coming, here's the losses that you're gonna incur, and here's the failure that you're gonna experience. So don't even try. Fear is always telling you a story. There's always a story that is facing you that fear wants to keep you from stepping into. This was a real problem for the early uh, followers of Jesus Christ, especially people that were coming out of the Jewish faith. The people that were coming out of the Jewish faith, when they would begin to hang out with Christians and begin to learn about Jesus, they were already experiencing persecution. Suddenly, 
I'm not gonna do business with you anymore. Why? Because we're a part of a community and you're stepping out of the community. You don't, you, don't, you don't get to be a part of that. They experience the pain of rejection, rejection of their own family, the loss of business opportunity. Some businesses failed. And so there was this sense of, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep following Jesus when it's costing me so much and it hurts so badly to do this? Why would I continue to do that? And what happens is, is you stay fixated on the story that's right in front of you. But there's a greater story beyond that story that's in front of you. How did Jesus do this? The writer of Hebrews wants us to understand this. Take a look. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews said this, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. In other words, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep going. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. The champion who starts your faith and who grows your faith. The one who begins your faith and matures your faith. He said, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. He's really taking us back and giving us an opportunity to understand what happened in a very particular moment. Here was the moment. Some of you may have heard about something called the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was alone and he is praying and he knows that he's going to go to the cross. He's there by himself and he's under so much stress about what he's about to go through that it says he's, he's, he's sweating like drops of blood. He is in anguish, his soul is in anguish. Because what he's gonna do is he's about to step into a place of unspeakable pain where he will die on the cross and take all of the darkness and all of the weight and all of the judgment for the sins of all humanity and take it upon himself. And worst of all in that moment would be the incredible loss of a sense of his father being with him as God the Father would turn his back on his own son in a moment of judgment and that Jesus was gonna go through all of this pain and that in the eyes of all of his disciples, it would look like everything they'd given their lives to for the past three years was a total failure. And he's in the garden and he's praying. And, and many of you remember what he said. He said, Father, if there's any other way, yet not my will, but your will be done. What enabled him to go, your will be done? Done. What enabled him to push through the anguish? What enabled him to push through the pain that was coming, the loss that was coming, and the sense of failure that would be in the eyes of his followers? The writer of Hebrews told us, it says, for the joy that was awaiting him, the joy that was set before him. There was a story beyond the story that was in front of him. There was a story that Jesus saw in his mind and in his heart. And it was a story that people would be forgiven of sin, that he would take our sins upon himself, that we could live our lives in relationship with him as fully forgiven, dearly loved children of God. He could envision what it was like for people no longer to live under the burden of a religion that would tell them, you've got to work hard and be good enough for God to love you. You've got to measure up. You better try harder. Everything inside of him was the joy of the story that was a greater story beyond the story that was in front of him. If you want to know what the story was, if you want to know what the joy was, and you want it to be personal, here's what I can tell you. It was you. It was your face. It was you being with him. It was you being set free. It was you living life, knowing him. It was you having an eternal destiny. It was you making a difference in this world and living the life that you were created to live, broken free from all the chains and all the bondage and everything else that holds you back. And in the moments of his greatest anguish, it was the joy of you, the joy of me, the joy of the glory of God, the joy of all of that, knowing that he would win the redemption of all mankind. There's a greater story than the story that was in front of him. 
When you face fear, your fear is trying to tell you a story that's trying to put a limit on your life. There's a greater story beyond the story that you see. The greater story. Listen, for some people that go, man, I really care about children, but man, you know, children's ministry, that means I gotta go to a service and serve in a service or serve in a service and go to a service. And man, I think about, I gotta get up a little earlier. There's a little sacrifice involved in all this. Stuff. And all you see is the pain of that. And you don't realize that there is a greater story beyond that, that one day a child is gonna grow up and a child is gonna be able to say how you as their small group leader in children's ministry introduced them to a savior and helped them to see a love that they didn't know was possible. For some of you that go, man, I care so much about students. And there's a part of you that wants to do it. There's a part of you that goes, oh, Wednesday nights, man. You know, Wednesday nights, that's kind of my night and I don't wanna really do that and it's gonna cost me this and that and the other thing. And that's the story that you see, but there's a greater story beyond that of a student who's gonna be able one day to say, I had this small group leader and man, they didn't just preach at me. You know what they did? They actually sat down, they got to know my world, they understood me, they encouraged me, they were there for my games, they, I mattered to them. Man, it changed my life to have someone like that because I didn't have a dad like that, but this person was like a dad to me. Let me tell you, there's a story that is beyond the story that you're facing. Fear is telling you a story, but there's always a greater story that's on the other side of it. For people that go, oh, I would love to make a difference. Yeah, leading a small group, oh, but I like Monday night football and I like Thursday night football and I hate to give up all my football and I got this and that and the other thing and it's gonna cost me this time to prepare and all of that and that's the story that you see, but there's a greater story beyond that and it's that one day somebody is gonna say, you changed my life. And the space that you created for me to be able to open up my heart and to learn was the space that God used to transform me. And I just wanna tell you, thank you. The greater story is not the story that we go on to social media and spin about ourselves. The greater story is a story that other people will be able to tell about you because of how you made a difference in their lives. Some of you have in your heart a ministry that isn't on campus here, but a ministry out there. He's broken your heart for a cause. And there's something going on inside of you. And you're like, well, man, I don't know how to do that, and I don't qualify, and I didn't go to seminary, and all these things. And all you think about is the story that fear is telling you. And there's a greater story that's on the other side of that. If you're willing to not let that fear control your life, and you go, okay, God, let's figure this out. But there's a greater story because I see freedom I see healing. I see people learning to thrive. I see single moms able to find freedom. I see people getting financially free. I see people getting off of addiction. I can see all these things, God. And some of you go, I don't know what the greater story is. He gave you the greater story when he broke your heart for that. It's already in you. You just have stopped looking at it because you keep looking at what it's going to cost you, the pain of it, the loss, and you look at the fear of failure. That's not the story, there's a greater story. That's the one that you choose. He says, that's what we learned from Jesus. So let me ask you, what's the greater story that God wants to bring through your life? What's the thing that he's been writing on your heart that you've been afraid because you look at the cost, you look at the loss, you have a sense of failure. And God says, don't let that control you. There's something beautiful that I want to create. For some of you, it's a business. That's that, that God has like put something inside of you and you know that where you are, it doesn't quite fit, but there's something inside of you because God wants to create a business because people need to see what it's like to work for a boss who's a believer and a follower of Jesus. And he wants them to experience what it is to be blessed, what it is when somebody has given their life to Jesus and the difference that it makes. And he wants to bring a provision for you in the lives of other people but you look at the cost and you look at all the, the things that are against you and I don't have any experience in this and I don't know any of this stuff. There's a greater story than the story of what's in front of you and it's the story of what God wants to create through you. But you've gotta choose the greater story. You already have it in you because God already broke your heart with it. There are ministries waiting to happen. God's waiting for you to stop listening to fear and to begin to choose a greater story of what he wants to do through you. Those are the first two things. Here's the third thing. Is God wants you to choose to focus on the with over the what. God wants you to choose to focus on the with over the what. 
See, what the, the problem is, is when, when, when we're going through something in our lives, there are some things that you face, uh, fears that you're dealing with that are very personal to you and nobody can really understand it because it's only you. You're going through it, nobody else can get it. You can Google it. You could find out other people's stories, but nothing really seems to apply because nobody's in your shoes. What you're going through is very personal to you. And the problem is, what do you do when Google doesn't have the answers? What do you do when you can't find the answers? Talking with people. What if the books don't have the answer? What if there's a path that's in front of you and it has pain and it has sacrifice and it has a fear of failure and they are all very real and they're staring at you? The problem is this. We go, God, what do I do? What's the plan? What's the next step? What is it that I should fix? What is it that I do? God, I'm gonna Google this. Okay, what, 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 what? And we're asking God all the time, what is it, what's the step? What's the information, what am I lacking? All of these things, what, 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 what? But you should be asking with whom am I gonna go through this? This is so important. When Jesus was talking to his followers, he was telling them, I'm going to die and I'm gonna be gone for a little bit. Every fear of abandonment that they had was triggered, every fear. And by the way, some of you have gone through that. That's a part of your story. It's very real. They're, they're all fearing abandonment. They're wondering, well, I've spent three years following you. Now, like, we're all done? Where's this gonna go? Jesus, in John chapter 14, says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. By the way, have you noticed how that doesn't work to just say it? You ever have anybody say that to you? Oh yeah, just trust God. He says, there's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? See, Jesus was doing something that the Jews would have understood. In that society, when a young man was gonna get married, what he did was he would go and prepare a place where he was gonna bring his bride to, a home. And the only reason he would build that is to bring her, so he'd be with her. So they understood what he was saying, but they didn't understand. He said, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me. Always be with me. That's what this is all about, that you would always be with me and you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said, going back to the what? What's the path? What's the way? What's the next step? What's the information that we lack? We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. But God, how do we? You stay with me. And I will get you exactly where you need to go. You just walk with me. But I need more information. Here's your information. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You will get to exactly where you need to go by walking with me. And you know, when you look at the scriptures, this was God's desire all the way through. I mean, we, we just got done with the Joshua series not that long ago. And, and you know, the, the verse that a lot of people know is be strong and courageous is what God spoke to Joshua. But before then, you know what it says in verse five of Joshua chapter one? Here's what it says. Just as I was with Moses, Joshua, so I will be with before he told them to be strong and courageous. We did a series on the 23rd Psalm. This is a very well-known statement. Many of you know it. Even if you've never been to church, you'll understand this, where, where David wrote, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You're with me. I've never been down to this valley of the shadow of death. You haven't, but we're all gonna get there someday. Well, what's that gonna look like? It's not a what. It's with. Choose with. 
When Jesus gave the instructions for those that knew him and knew his love and his forgiveness to go into the world and help people to know him and to grow in him, Matthew chapter 28, in verse 20, Jesus said this, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, when you're desperately trying so hard to know the what, that's when you need to choose the with. It's not what the answer is. It's not what the information is. It's who you're going with. And to be able to say, God, I don't know what to do. I've never been divorced before. I don't know how to do this. God, just be with me in this. Lead me through this. God, I've never dealt with a diagnosis like this before. I don't know the way. I'm the way. Walk with me. I'll get you exactly where you need to go. God, I don't know what to do in this business. I can't, I can't figure this thing out. What do I do? Walk with me. I'm the way. I'm the truth. You'll have everything you need. I'll make sure you get there. And I'm the life. I'll make it count. So God, I choose the with over the what. I'll tell you where this really got burned into my, my heart. A few years back, there was a couple that they didn't have any family, no kids, no, no relatives. It was just them, good friends, just loved them. And, and my friend went into the hospital. He was having a burning sensation. And so he went in and, and a doctor said, you've got liver cancer. You've got about five days to live. Now I'm sitting there going, what do I say? I've never, I've never had to do anything like this and walk with them through it. I've never had to walk through a husband and wife saying goodbye. I've never, have ever been a part of anything like that. I was like, God, what do I do? And I'd go home and I was like so overwhelmed, so afraid. I wasn't gonna be what they needed. I, I just didn't know what to do. It was over my head. I was driving to the hospital to spend some time with them. I was like, God, what do I do? And, and the Lord impressed this passage. Mark, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And I have led many people down this path before and I know how to lead them too. Just help them to be close to me and I will get them where they need to go. I didn't need any other answer than that. And God did the most beautiful work in that situation of leading my friend into the arms of Jesus. And I never, ever, walking into any situation was overwhelmed by, I don't know what to do. I already know what to do. It's not to stop asking what to do. And to focus on with. Over what? He will be with you. You know, the only thing that makes all three of these choices possible is one thing. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection, there is no way, truth, or life. Without the resurrection, there, there is no, uh, you know, fear, the greater fear. Without the truth of the resurrection, there, there are none of these things. It is because Jesus has been raised from the dead and establish his power over death and given the power of an invincible life that we can live our lives without fear. Some of you, you're facing a situation now. you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And you keep going, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I want you to open up your heart this morning to what is a with him. Invite him into it. Invite him into the space. Stop trying to figure it out. I guarantee you, he's gonna unfold what to do. He's gonna surround you. He's gonna lead you. You can trust him. And for those of you that, that you've had a, something in your heart, a dream, something that, that, that you, you just looked at what it's gonna cost you and you've looked at the fear of failure and I don't know that I have what it takes and I don't know any of this stuff. Today, God is saying to you, there's a greater story than the story that you keep paying attention to. Now I want you to let the greater story to lead you and guide you. And today's the day 
that you choose, that fear will no longer be the limit on your life, that you're gonna walk with him in it. I'm gonna ask you guys to close your eyes if you would, bow your head, I'm gonna ask you at home, you do the same thing. I wonder who is, who's here and you go, there is something that God has put in my heart and I've been afraid to step into that. Just raise your hand. There's something that you've been afraid of and maybe it's a, a medical thing, maybe it's a relationship thing, maybe it's a business thing, maybe it's a ministry thing, but there's a part of you that has been so afraid, okay? Because I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray for you right now. Choose one of those. The greater fear, the greater story, or the with. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for every single person that has opened their heart to you in this moment, acknowledge the fear that they carry. God, I pray that as they step forward and move beyond that fear, God, you give them the story that needs to burn in their heart. God, you give them the greater fear that will motivate them and move them forward. And God, when there are no answers, that your presence and the promise of you being with them will be enough. I pray that you would give a perfect peace that passes all understanding and that you will lead them. You've walked others down that path. May you show yourself strong on behalf of all those taking a step today. And I'm gonna ask if there's anyone that you've just never given Jesus your life. Maybe you were afraid. Maybe you thought, ah, I don't wanna become one of those Jesus freaks. I don't wanna become like other Christians. Forget about what anybody else thinks about you. Would you be willing to let God move you into the life that you were created to live? Will you take this moment and give him your life? Will you say I'm done with settling for less? Will you discover the power of God that happens when you surrender? Will you do that? And will you trust him, the one who loves you like no other, that has the power greater than any other power but cares for you greater than any other person ever could? If you're ready, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. You just say, God, that's me, that's me, okay. All right, anyone else, okay. All right, those of you at home, if that's you, you, want, you raise your hand too. I'm gonna lead you guys in a prayer. Here's what I wanna do. I want all of us to pray this together so nobody hears their voice hanging out there, okay? So for those of you that want to do that, and for all of us here, let's all pray this together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you love me and that you paid for my sin. So I turn from sin and I give you my life and I ask you to come in. From this day forward, I am your child and you're my God. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you guys give it up for those that made that choice today? Guys, congratulations. Listen, before you go, if today you took that step of faith, I want you to do something. We have people out there, you'll see a table. We have a new believer's Bible. It's called the Christian Basics Bible. It's a great Bible, along with a, a copy of what is called The Purpose Driven Life, and it answers the question, what on earth am I here for? Pick one of those up. Let us know about your decision. We'll help you take next steps. If you're watching and you uh, also want that and you took a step of faith, just text the word GRACE, G-R-A-C-E, to the number on your screen, and we'll get that to you as well. And guys, if you just want someone to talk to, uh, those our, our people are waiting out there to be able to pray with you, talk with you. And guys, just know this, God loves you. He wants you free from the power of fear. He wants you to step into a space where you get to see what he does through you when you choose to no longer get, give in to that, all right? Guys, let's stand up. Let's, let's, let's dismiss with a blessing today. You can give it up for God one more time, you guys. It's all right. Thank you. So may God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, infuse you with a peace that passes all understanding, that as you take steps of faith and trust him, as you move through your fear, 
May you see God respond in a way that far exceeds anything you could ask or ever imagine. May you be able one day to tell a story of the step that you took and may others be able to tell the story of how God used you to impact their lives because you stopped being afraid. And may it be so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey.